text this morning is Matthew 10, verses 28 through 32. Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 through 32. If uh, you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 815. Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 through 32. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. This is God's word. Well, good morning. It's time for sermon number two. I may just preach Ben's here again. He left it up here, so it's pretty good. <laughs> okay. A um, couple of things before we get started today. First of all, uh, as many of you know, this is going to be my uh, last week in the pulpit for about a month here. So, And I got like 11 pages of notes, so... I'm just going to preach the whole month before I leave. Uh, so do, do pray for uh, Trisha and I and the kids as we go. I'm going to be working on my, my project and doing some writing there and starting to, to get that thing rolling. So uh, pray that God gives me clarity and just really helps me zone in on some of these things. Uh, I'm really excited about the series that, that Brian and Manuel and Jason have for you. They've been working on this for... Uh, quite some time, probably about a year and a half, it's kind of been in the works. And so this series is going to be on Daniel. You might have seen the posters around faithfulness in a fallen world. And they're going to be preaching through the major narrative sections of Daniel. There's about, there's about five of them, and they're going to take a crack. So you're going to be fed and well looked after. I have no doubt that these messages are going to be great. Every time Brian opens the word for us, We are encouraged, and so I leave you in very capable hands in the pulpit. No worries on my part. Um, I'm going to listen to the sermons myself. Um, Second, um, this is not a typical sermon today. So if you're new to Calvary, this is not typically what we do. I was kind of chuckling as as Ben was saying, and the sermons are very connected to the Scripture. Not so much today, okay? Uh, (laughs) Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to be talking about the life of John Peyton. And before I get into this, I, I just want to show you, this is all I read, okay? This, is not, th- this was not rocket science or anything. Th- this is his autobiography, which contains basically everything we know about John Peyton. If you would like to get your hot little hands on this, uh, come and see me afterwards. We'd be happy to get cop- copies. This is a page turner. I'm not kidding you. I, I've read it twice, and I, I basically read it again this week, just thumbing through it again. It is a hard-to-put-down one because it's just so chocked full of excitement and adventure, and you'll see that here in a few moments. Uh, it's called John G. Payton, Missionary to the New Hebrides. So if you'd like to get your hands on it, we'll, we'll be happy to order a bunch for people. Um, why do we do this on Memorial Day? Why do we take the life of some Christian that has gone before us and lived faithfully and really try to take their life and learn from it? Well, you know, there's actually a biblical mandate of biography. Did you know that? It's in the Bible, right? In Hebrews chapter, uh, I just lost my verse, 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7 says this very simply. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So that's what we're really trying to do today. We're considering those who have gone before us, who have been faithful. We are marking their way of life and then we're considering the outcome of their faith. And I hope that as we look at the life of John Payton today, you will be stirred up to greater courage and fearlessness in the face of opposition. So, 
Having said that, will you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Father, we do need your help today. And we are so grateful that in your mercy you have promised that you would meet with your people as we come before you. Through Jesus, Lord, we come with boldness and confidence. He has made the way for us. And we petition you as our great and loving Heavenly Father that you would outpour your Spirit upon us in great measure and stir us up through the life of this faithful servant. Lord, we love you. We delight in you. We praise God. We praise you for all that you have done in our lives. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. To quote the great American theologian, Jim Croce, you don't tug on Superman's cape, you don't spit into the wind, you don't pull the mask off an old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Jim. Fitting, isn't it? Right. I think the song actually says he was big and dumb and ugly as well, so... uh, (laughs) When you study the life of John Payton, you get the sense that this guy was made of the same type of stuff that Jim Croce's Jim Walker was made of. But John Payton was no mere legend. He was a real man enabled by God to encounter some of the most difficult situations imaginable and seemingly without even batting an eye. I think that one way Payton's life could be summarized is by looking at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. It seems that these words were burned into the Scotsman's very soul. Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my father in heaven. So we're going to take a look at how these words from scripture apply particularly to John Payton in a moment. But before I do... I need to acquaint you with this man, okay? Before we kind of look at how Matthew chapter 10 intersects with the life of this brave missionary, I need to acquaint you with who he is. John Gibson Payton was born to James and Janet Payton on May 24th, 1824. He was the oldest of 11 children and spent most of his growing up years in Thorthorwall, Scotland. During his childhood years, John was greatly influenced by the devoutness of his father, who would go three times a day to his prayer closet and who conducted family prayers twice a day. By the age of 12, John felt a call leading him to foreign missions. Here's what he wrote. I had given my soul to God and was resolved to aim. I was resolved to aim at being a missionary of the cross or a minister of the gospel. When John grew to adulthood, he headed to Glasgow with the blessing of his parents to gain a theological education. While there, Peyton not only received his training, but became involved in an urban ministry which greatly flourished under his leadership. After 10 years in Glasgow, Peyton and his young wife, Mary, set sail for the New Hebrides Island in the South Pacific. That is now known as Vanuatu. They landed on the island of Tana, which was inhabited by cannibals with no established church whatsoever. Shortly after their arrival on Tana, Mary died, and John alone endured four years of the most intense opposition to the gospel that you could imagine. He saw little fruit during those first four years at all. In the end, Peyton, along with another missionary couple, had to flee Tana, barely escaping with their lives, rescued by the last moment at a ship that happened to pass by. After Peyton left the New Hebrides, he went to Australia and then to Scotland, charged with the task of rebuilding and refunding the crumbled mission to the New Hebrides. During this season, God used John Peyton in a completely unexpected way. 
namely to rouse the Reformed churches of Scotland and Australia and Canada to missionary service. Within his own denomination, the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Scotland, such was most markedly the case. Peyton wrote this. I was filled with high passion of gratitude to be able to proclaim that at the close of my tour, listen carefully to this stat, that of all her ordained ministers, one in every six was a missionary of the cross. As a result of Peyton's tour of the West, missionary after missionary not only headed to the New Hebrides, but all over the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. After Peyton had refunded and rebuilt the mission, he and his new bride, Maggie Whitecross, set sail for Aniwa, the island that neighbored Tana in the New Hebrides. Although the conditions on Aniwa were similar to Tana, the work was sl- and the work was very slow in the beginning, God began to bring forth an abundant harvest, such that Peyton could have never imagined. Fifteen years after Peyton arrived on Aniwa, 3,500 natives had come to Christ. That was half the population. After nearly 30 years of ministry on that island, John Payton could rightly say, I claimed Aniwa for Jesus, and by the grace of God, Aniwa now worships at the Savior's feet. Today, over 85% of the Vanuatuans are part of Christian churches, with more than 20% of them being evangelical. Payton died at the age of 82 but not before translating and publishing an Aniwan New Testament and seeing missionary stations on 25 of the 30 islands of the New Hebrides. Peyton accomplished more in a lifetime that that can ever be imagined. Apart from the grace of God, Peyton's life is inexplicable. So what lessons do we learn from this man and his life? Or in what ways should we strive to emulate him? It is those questions that we'll seek to answer by applying Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 10 to this missionary's life. So, here's how I'm going to proceed. I have two questions and answers, okay? Questions and answers are rooted in Scripture and then illustrated by Peyton's life, okay? So, that's how we're going to go. It. So, overcoming fear with faith. If you were taking notes there, that's the main point here. Question number one, why are we tempted to fear? And the answer, very simply, the world is a fearful place. Notice in our passage, Jesus begins with the words, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear. Have you ever thought about it? Why did Jesus have to say that in the first place? Why did he have to command us to not fear? The reason is very simple, because we live in a place where oftentimes we are very Tempted to fear. Look look at the text, will you? Verse 28. And do not fear those who... What's the word? Those who kill the body. To put it plainly, we are tempted to fear because the world is a fearful place. Because in the world that we live in, people do kill the body. They do. People hurt other people. And that's not all. The context of our passage makes it very plain that killing's not the only dreadful thing that people do if we're following Jesus. Look at verse 17 of Matthew chapter 10. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake. Matthew chapter 10, 21. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Verse number 25. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they had called you master of the house of... I'm sorry. If they have called the master of the house of Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? What is Jesus saying? We live in a world that if you're following Jesus, you will face temptations to fear. You will face opposition. You will face suffering. You will face hard things. Why are we tempted to fear? Because let's be honest, this world we live in is scary. It's a fearful place. And people really do kill the body. So, as our Lord tells us that, you live in a fearful place, it is, he says in the same breath, don't fear. Even though people kill the body, don't be afraid. 
So what does this mean? Well, first of all, it, it does not mean that we can or even should try to avoid every fearful situation. Our text makes that plain, doesn't it? Believers will encounter fearful situations. So when the Bible says do not fear, it doesn't mean like go hide under a rock somewhere where nobody can get you. That's, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying you live in a fearful place and in spite of everything that's going on, I don't, I don't want you to fear. That doesn't mean go and hide. The second thing that it doesn't mean is this. It does not mean that you will never be tempted to fear. Now listen carefully. It is not sinful to be tempted to fear. It's not sinful to be tempted to fear. It is sinful to yield to fear and allow allow fear to cripple you from doing what you should do. That's what sin. So for instance... If I am talking to a person that doesn't know Jesus and 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 God opens up a gospel opportunity for me, let's say it's the best one in the world. They say, what must I do to be saved like the Philippian jailer? Okay. If you're a human being, what happens in your stomach at that moment? You get a little butterfly, you know, there's a little bit of nervousness or uneasiness okay am i going to say this right am i going to fumble am i going to bumble it's not sinful to be tempted to fear it's not sinful to have a butterfly in your stomach what is sinful for you to say well i don't want to hinder our relationship i I don't want to say anything that would put them off or anything so though i know i should share the gospel i'm not going to say anything that's yielding to fear sometimes as believers if we are If we are living faithfully, we are going to be in very, very fearful situations. It's not wrong to be tempted to fear. It is wrong for you to yield to your fears such that you don't obey what God calls you to do in the midst of those fears. We believe that Jesus was tempted in every way like we are, right? Hebrews chapter 4. Was Jesus tempted to fear? Certainly. Did Jesus face fearful situations? Certainly. Here's the question. Did Jesus yield to his fear? Yes or no? No. That's what Christ is saying here. And do not fear. Don't yield to fear. Don't let fear dominate you or govern you. So, this becomes rather clear in the next part of the verse. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather... Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, we should fear displeasing God more than we fear displeasing man. This is a principle that we see modeled in the life of John Payton over and over again. Payton faced many harrowing circumstances. So he's in the midst of a circumstance and there were two options. One, I am, I am fearful and so I can yield to my fear and not do what God wants or I can be obedient even though it's fearful. Peyton time and time again said, whose opinion matters more to me? Man's opinion or God's opinion? God's opinion mattered. I don't fear man, I fear God. I don't fear man, I, don't, I fear God. Over and over again, you'll see that. I don't care what men say, I care what God says. I am more fearful of displeasing God than I am fearful of displeasing man. I think that's what Jesus is trying to help us to understand here. So, what were the type of things that Peyton faced that caused him to be tempted to fear? What were some of the fearful circumstances? That's what we're going to look at right here. First of all, criticism. As we've already noted, Peyton planned to go to the island of the New Hebrides, which was inhabited by cannibals, real cannibals. I mean, people that ate people. It was documented. It happened often there. In fact, just 19 years before Peyton made his journey, two missionaries from the London Missionary Society, John Williams and John Harris, landed on the island of Iromanga. Both of these men were killed and eaten just minutes after reaching the shore. When Peyton began to make it known that he planned to head to the island, he was met with astounding opposition on virtually 
every front. Um, what I want you to notice about Peyton here is this, there is this fearlessness. I mean, it's, it's uncanny almost the way that he talks to people. It's like he's not even aware of other people. He is so confident in who God is. So notice this one. Speaking of his objectors, amongst many who sought to deter me was one dear old Christian gentleman whose crowning argument was the cannibals. You will be eaten by the cannibals. At last, I replied, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that I cannot that if I cannot live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether am I, I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. The old gentleman raising his hands in a deprecating attitude left the room explaining, I have nothing to say after that. But this was not the only kind of criticism that Peyton faced. He planned to go to the New Hebrides. And remember, he had been involved in a very successful ministry in Glasgow. It was flourishing and people were being saved all the time. Virtually no one, aside from his parents and a few wise and godly elders, were counseling to go. Um, some pleaded with him. Others offered him money to stay. He was presented with a parsonage at no charge. And still others argued, there are heathen at home. Let us seek and save, first of all, the lost one perishing at our doors. And yet in spite of all the unrelenting criticism that Peyton faced, he felt a strong sense of divine calling and he went anyway. The second thing and more bone crushing and mind numbing of the opposition that Peyton faced was the loss that he encountered. Once Peyton reached the New Hebrides, it was by no means smooth sailing. John and his pregnant wife, Mary, landing on the Isle of Tana on November 5th, 1858. Track the chronology with me, November 5th. On February 12th, a baby boy was born to the young couple. And the child, after the child was born, Mary was hit by bout after bout after fever and ague. Ague is like a, uh, a disease similar to malaria. Uh, has the same types of symptoms. This was followed by pneumonia and eventually delirium. And then Mary started to recover. And then suddenly on March 3rd, just four months after they had arrived, she died. But Peyton's loss was not over. To crown my sorrows, he wrote, and complete my loneliness, the dear baby boy whom we have named after her father, Peter Robert Robson, was taken from me after one week's sickness on the 20th of March. Let those who have ever passed through any similar darkness as of midnight feel for me as for all others. It would be more than vain to try to paint my sorrows. So there he is, young man, his bride, his child. She was the picture of health when she arrived. And within a few months, he was alone. No wife, no baby. But Peyton faced more. Not only did he face the loss, he faced illness himself. He was not immune to the illness that claimed his wife's life. During the first two or three years on Tana, he suffered from fever and ague severely, he writes, 14 times, often finding himself on the very doorstep of death. Listen to this account. The fever smote me again more severely than ever. My weakness after this attack was so great that I felt as if I could never rally again. I made what appeared to be my last effort to creep. I could not climb up the hill to get a breath of wholesome air. When about two-thirds up the hill, I became so faint that I concluded that I was dying. Lying down on the ground, sloped against the root of a tree to keep me from rolling to the bottom, I took farewell of old Abraham, of my mission work, and of everything around, in this weak state, I lay, watched over by my faithful companion, Abraham, we'll say more about him in a moment, and fell into a quiet and deep sleep. Can you imagine? Your wife dies of this illness, and you get it over and over and over and over again, thinking maybe every time, this is it, 
done. I'm going to die. I'm not going to survive. Though his health improved, these bouts with serious illness never left him. Peyton was always aware that his life could be snuffed out by the strength of tropical illness. However, above all these, the most common and harrowing danger that Peyton faced were the threats on his life. Almost constant threats upon his life. He writes, For a long time I had seldom taken off my clothes at night, needing to be constantly on the alert to start at a moment's notice. Peyton's autobiography is loaded. I'm not kidding by this. Loaded with hair-raising story after hair-raising story. I could have had like two dozen of these. I just picked a few, some of the highlights. I mean, this guy, you think he's going to die every chapter. I mean, you're like, I I don't know how he survived. He is. He's Big Jim Walker somehow. I mean, he just is. It's unreal. Listen, one morning at daybreak, I found my house surrounded by armed men. That's normal. And a chief intimated that they had assembled to take my life. So they're armed and they're organized. (laughs) Seeing that I was entirely in their hands, I knelt down and gave away myself, body and soul, to the Lord Jesus for what seemed to be the last time on earth. Rising, I went out to them and began calmly talking to them about their unkind treatment of me and contrasting it with all my conduct towards them. At last, some of the chief who had attended the worship rose and said, Our conduct has been bad, but now we will fight for you and kill all those who hate you. (laughs) Try this on for a day at the office. A wild chief followed me around for four hours with a loaded musket. And though often directed towards me, God restrained his hands. I spoke kindly to him and attended to my work as if he had not been there. Fully persuaded that my God had placed me there and would protect me until my allotted task was finished. Looking up in unceasing prayer to our dear Lord Jesus, I left all in his hands and felt immortal till my work was done. Trials and a hairbreadth escape strengthened my faith and seemed only to nerve me for more to follow. And they did tread swiftly upon each other's heels. I wouldn't get a lot done at work if a guy had a gun pointed at my head all day. On his last night on the island of Tana, Peyton faced this scene. A glare of light fell into the room. Men passed with flaming torches, and first they set fire to the church all around, and then to the reed fence connecting the church and the dwelling house. In a few minutes, the house too would be in flames, and armed savages waiting to kill us on attempting to escape. Taking my harmless revolver, it had been drowned in the sea and was useless to him. In the left hand and a little American tomahawk in the right, I pleaded with Mr. Matheson to let me out and instantly to lock the door on himself and his wife. He reluctantly did so. Seven or eight savages had surrounded me and raised their great clubs in the air. I heard a shout, kill him, kill him. One savage tried to seize hold of me, but leaping from his clutch, I drew the revolver from my pocket and leveled it as if for use, my heart going up in prayer to God. I said, dare to strike me and my Jehovah God will punish you. He protects us and will punish you for burning his church, for hating his worship and people and for all your bad conduct. We love you and for doing you good, you only want to kill us, but our God is here now to protect us and to punish you. They yelled, enraged, and urged one another to strike the first blow, but the invisible one restrained them. I stood invulnerable beneath his invisible shield and succeeded in rolling back the tide of flame from our dwelling house. Through these and many other fearful situations, Peyton endured. So we're left to ask, how? How did he face Such harrowing circumstances, trying to do the Lord's will. How did he look fear in the eye and keep acting courageously in spite of all the fearful situations that surrounded him? You know, if you put yourself in those situations, what would you have done? I mean, would you have crumbled, cowered, ran? But Peyton stayed the course. So 
How? Well, I think we're given a clue in Matthew chapter 10. How can we overcome fear? The answer, trusting in the character of God. Back in our text, after Jesus charges his disciples, do not be afraid. He provides them with the reason for their fearlessness. Did you catch that in the text? Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. That's, that's a reason right there. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. That's another reason. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. There's another one. Fear not, therefore. You are more valued than the sparrows. There's another. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. There's another reason. Basically, Jesus is making a case. He's saying, listen, here's why you shouldn't fear. And he goes down through a list of reasons here. Jesus does not patronizingly say, don't be afraid. There's nothing to be fearful about. You know, have you ever had somebody say that to you when that's just not true? Jesus isn't patronizing us. No, Jesus is a realist. He knows that the world is a fearful place. He knows that people lose jobs. He knows that people lose money. He knows that people face opposition for preaching Christ. He knows that some people are martyred for preaching Christ. He knows that people suffer um, illness and death. He knows that that's the reality. So he doesn't just kind of walk up to us, pat us on the head and say, now, now, don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. He doesn't say that at all. He says, do not fear. And then he roots our confidence. He roots our fearlessness in who his father is. Did you notice that in the text? All of the reasons that Jesus gives us for being fearless are rooted in a right understanding of God himself. If you could give me liberty here, I'm going to loosely para paraphrase what Jesus is saying. Do not be afraid of man. They can only hurt you so much. Fear God. He's all powerful. Don't forget God is in control of everything. Even when a bird falls from a tree and he loves you far more than a bird. In the end, God's purposes will triumph. He's the judge of all things. Don't fear man. Fear God. If we are crippled by fear, listen carefully to me on this, folks. You, get, you need to aim your theological thinking caps right now. If you are crippled by fear, if you are not doing what God calls you to do because you're afraid, you have bad theology. It's just bad theology. Theology means the doctrine or the study of God. If you are fearful and crippled by fear to do what is right, then you have a bad view of who God is. That's what I'm saying. Okay? Un unpack that a little bit. I, I will. Hang on. What enabled John Payton to act so fearlessly is in the midst of fearful circumstances, he consistently remembered the character of his father. Over and over again, we see that. Peyton's courage was not rooted in sloppy sentimentality. Things will get better. Everything will be okay. Look on the bright side. To every crowd, there's a silver lining. No, Peyton's fearlessness was based on an unshakable confidence that God was God and he knew who he was. That's, that was the roots of his fearlessness. Peyton said, I know who God is, and therefore, I can stay faithful to the task that he has called me. I won't be afraid because I know who God is. So you ask, what is it about God that Peyton held on to so tightly? Let me outline a few of them. First of all, Peyton recognized God's love. When Peyton was criticized for wanting to head to the dangers of the New Hebrides, he began himself to question whether or not he should go. 
But when Peyton wrote a letter to his godly parents, now aside here, you could write in it, you could do an entire message on Peyton's parents. They were unreal. His faith was, in one sense, handed down to him from them. They trusted God deeply. So that's an admonition to parents here. Where do John Peyton's come from? They don't grow on trees, okay? They come from families who begin to teach their children who God is and help them to remember their character. So moms and dads, if you want a little John Peyton in your home, teach them who God is. Remind them of the character of the father. So Peyton was struggling, uncertain what to do. His mother responded, Heretofore, we feared to bias you. But now we must tell you why we praise God for the decision to which you have been led. Your father's heart was always set upon being a minister, but other claims forced him to give it up. When you were given to us, our firstborn, to be, we consecrated you to God. If God saw fit as a missionary of the cross, and it has been our constant prayer that you might be prepared, qualified, and led to this very decision, and we pray with all our hearts that the Lord may accept your offering, long spare you, and give you many souls from the heathen world for your hire. When Peyton got that letter from his mom, he viewed it as an entire, as a visible example of God's loving hand upon him. He just gushed about how God loved him so dearly by giving him a mom and dad such as that. On another occasion, when Peyton and his native Christian teachers were surrounded by angry enemies, Peyton reveled in the love of Christ for him. Notice this. A killing stone thrown by one of the savages grazed old Abraham's cheek. And the dear soul gave such a look to me and then upwards as if to say, Missy, I was nearly away to Jesus. A club was also raised to follow the blow of the killing stone. They encircled us in a deadly ring. One kept urging another to strike the first blow or fired the first shot. I have felt my reason reeling, my sight coming and going, and my knees smiting together when thus brought so close to a violent death. Now, notice how he interprets it, though. Yet with Paul, I could say even in these dread moments and crisis of being, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. No matter what the missionary faced, he never lost confidence that he was loved and guided by the hand of his heavenly father. Here's what he wrote. Did ever a mother run more quickly to protect her crying child in danger's hour than the Lord Jesus hastens to answer the believing prayer and send help to his servants in his own good time and way so far as it shall be for his glory and their good. Why was Peyton so brave? He knew that God loved him. That's why. One of the reasons he was so fearless is because he was absolutely confident that no matter what came to him, God loved him. Second thing that he recognized about God, he knew that God was present or God's presence. <laughs> no doubt the most quoted verse in Peyton's autobiography is Matthew twenty eight twenty. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. After Peyton buried his wife and son, he slept on their graves to prevent the cannibals from digging them up and eating their bodies. This event nearly pushed him off the brink of sanity. After that traumatic experience, he wrote this. Stunned by the dreadful loss in entering upon the field of labor to which the Lord himself had so evidently led me, my reason seemed for a time almost to give way. The ever merciful Lord sustained me. And that spot, speaking of the grave, became my sacred and much frequented shrine during all of the following months and years when I labored for the salvation of the savage islanders amidst difficulties, dangers, and deaths. But for the presence 
and fellowship of Jesus that he vouchsafed for me there, I must have gone mad and died beside the lonely grave. Peyton also felt the dark cloud of almost daily threats on his life would have driven him mad or to paranoia had he not been aware of God's presence with him. Without the abiding consciousness of the presence and the power of my dear Lord and Savior, nothing else in all the world could have preserved me from losing my reason and perishably, perishing miserably. In his words, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, became so real to me that it would not have startled me to behold him, as Stephen did, gazing down upon the scene. I had my nearest and deepest glimpses of the face and the smiles of the blessed Lord in those dread moments when musket club or spear was raised or leveled at my head. Oh, the bliss of living and enduring and seeing him who is invisible. One more about God's presence. One harrowing escape found Peyton running with his enemies right beside him. The host of armed men ran along on each side with their weapons ready. But leaving everything to Jesus, I ran on as if they were my escort or as if I saw them not. If any reader wonders how they were restrained, much more would I, unless I believed that the same hand that restrained the lions from touching Daniel held back these savages from hurting me. We came to a stream crossing our path. With a bound, all my party leaped it, ran to the opposite bank and disappeared into the bush. I also tried to leap, but I struck a branch and slid back on my hands and knees toward the stream. At this moment, I heard a crash above my head among the branches of an overhanging tree, and I knew that a kawas, a killing stone, had been thrown and that the branch had saved me. Praising my God, I scrambled up the other side and followed the track of my party into the bush. The savages gazed after me for a while in silence, but no one crossed the stream. With what gratitude did I recognize the invisible one who brought their counsel to confusion? It appears that Peyton actually believed that Jesus was with him all the time. That he wouldn't be surprised if he saw him there. He would, so firm was his confidence that Christ was present with him that he just wasn't surprised when the Lord delivered him. God's abiding presence and Peyton's faith in the presence of Jesus enabled him to face situations that would buckle the knees of the most stout of person. Next one, God's wisdom. John Payton also had confidence in the wisdom of God, trusting that God had a perfect plan even when he did not understand his way. Now, now listen to this one. This is so significant here. When looking back on the early years of difficulty and trial in ministry, here's what Payton reflected. Oftentimes, while passing through the perils and defeats of my first four years in the mission field on Tana, I wondered why God permitted such things. But on looking back, I already clearly perceived that the Lord was thereby preparing me for doing and providing me materials wherewith to accomplish the best work of all my life, namely the kindling of the heart of the Australian Presbytery with a living affection for these islands of their own southern seas and being the instrument under God of sending of sending out missionary after missionary to the New Hebrides to claim another island and still another for Jesus, that work and all that may spring from it in time and eternity never could have been accomplished by me but for the, for the first sufferings and then the story of my Tana enterprise. In other words, Peyton suffered these four terrible years. And he loaded his life with stories of God's deliverance and escape in the midst of suffering. He went back to the churches of Australia and Scotland and Canada and began to share what God was doing and calling people to go to the mission field. And from that, scores and dozens of missionaries went to reach the islands of the New Hebrides because of it. It, God, Peyton looked back and said, it could have never been accomplished had not God put me through the suffering that I endured. It seems that Peyton learned well the words to the old hymn, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind his frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Last one. Perhaps more than anything else, 
John Payton had an unshakable confidence in God's sovereignty. In spite of his critics, he believed his confidence that it was his confidence that caught in God's sovereignty that he knew that God's gospel would triumph in the New Hebrides because he believed that God was sovereign over man's hearts. Here's what he said before he went. In the darkest moment, I never doubted that ultimately the victory here on the New Hebrides, as well as elsewhere, would belong on the side of Jesus, believing that the whole earth would yet to be filled with the glory of the Lord. In his autobiography, Peyton tells story after story of God's sovereign power to change the hearts of even the cannibals. Here's one story about Abraham, the person that's been mentioned a couple times, who was a former cannibal and trusted Christ. When I have read or heard the shallow objections of irreligious scribblers and talkers, hinting that there was no reality in conversion and that mission effort was but waste, oh, how my heart has yearned to plant them just one week on Tana with the natural man all around in the person of the cannibal and the heathen, and only one spiritual man in the person of the converted Abraham, nursing them, feeding them, saving them for the love of Jesus, that I might just learn how many hours it took to convince them that Christ in man was a reality after all. All the skepticism of Europe would hide its head in foolish shame and all its doubts would dissolve under one glance of new light that Jesus and Jesus alone pours from the converted cannibal's eye. He wrote this. Peyton was a man that did not mince words. It would give me a wonderful shock. I'm sorry. It would give a wonderful shock, I suppose, to many namby-pamby Christians to whom the title Mighty to Save conveys no idea of reality to be told that nine or ten converted murderers were, part, were partaking of the Holy Communion of Jesus. Peyton was confident that God's sovereign power would triumph in the, in the New Hebrides because he believed that God was sovereign over the hearts of men, even over cannibals. He was also confident that God's sovereign power was far greater than the forces of darkness which imprisoned the residents of the New Hebrides. At one servant service, three revered sacred men who were brothers came bragging of their ability to kill anybody they wanted to by the power of their god, Nahak. Peyton decided to take the witch doctors to task. The ceremony to kill a person required that you had a partially eaten piece of of fruit. So Peyton asked a woman seated nearby for three pieces of fruit. He took a bite out of each of them and tossed them to the witch doctors. Jehovah is stronger than Nahak, he said. I challenge you to try to kill me, but not with spear or club, but with your incantations. The brothers agreed and said the missionary would be dead within the day. The day passed and Peyton was neither ill nor dead. The witch doctors gathered more sacred men and more rituals were performed, but Peyton remained fine. This went on for three days until two of the brothers conceded that Jehovah was more powerful than Nahak. The third man, angered by the embarrassment, went home and came back carrying a large spear intending to run the missionary through. Peyton calmly addressed him. If you kill me with that spear, you prove that Nahak is weak and Jehovah is strong. And my God, my strong God will punish you for your wickedness in killing his servant. He played that card a lot. Finally, Peyton was confident that God would accomplish his purpose in his own life. And therefore, in spite of all the natives' attempts, he could not be harmed until God was finished with him. One of my favorite sections in all of the book is this. My heart rose up to Jesus and I saw him watching all the scene. My peace came back to me like a wave from God. And I realized that I was immortal till my master's work with me was done. The assurance came to me as if a voice out of heaven had spoken that not a musket would be fired to wound us, not a club prevail to strike us, not a spear leave the hand in which it was being held vibrating to be thrown, not an arrow leave the bow or a killing stone the finger without the permission of Jesus Christ who is all power in heaven and on earth. He rules all nature, inanimate and adamant, and restrains even the savage of the south 
sees. Peyton had a radical and unflinching confidence in the sovereignty of God. So what does the life of John Peyton teaches us? It teaches us that we can be fearless. But not the kind of naive bravado that either ignores the reality of danger or ignores the possibility of death. That's not the type of confidence and courage Peyton had. Peyton knew that danger was real and Peyton knew that he could die. But Peyton was grounded. His fearlessness was rooted in an absolute confidence in the character of God. Friend, here's the call of John Peyton's life. I'm going I'm to summarize it in, in four words. Okay, two here, two here. Ready? Here's the call. I'm sorry, I can't count. Six words, okay. Know God deeply. That's where it started, right? He couldn't have the type of courage that he had if he didn't know God deeply. He knew that God was sovereign. He didn't just read it in the Bible once. He knew it. It was in his soul. He knew that God loved him. He knew that God was wise. He knew that God was with him. Know God deeply. Friends, are you afraid? Is it because you've forgotten who the Father is? Know God deeply. And that should lead us to another conclusion. Follow him recklessly. If we believe... If we believe who God is, that he is sovereign, that he is loving, that he is wise, we can follow him with absolute abandon, doing his will for his glory and our good. That's the simple lesson of Peyton's life. Know God deeply, follow God recklessly. May God make us people that actually believe John 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can kill both the soul and body in hell. Friends, my desire for our church is that we would know this God so intimately that we would follow him into whatever fray he calls us into because we are trusting in his character. Faith is how you overcome fear. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the example of your servant, John Payton. We thank you for these words of scripture that deeply encourage us to follow you into the fray. Lord, I pray that we would not waste our lives seeking lesser goods, but we would spend and be spent living to exalt the name of Jesus because we have great confidence in the character of our God. We thank you just for this opportunity to pause and reflect on this today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.